We have a very special uh, presentation, a very special guest. Uh, Catherine Foster is here with us this morning. She is here, uh, our new associate pastor of uh, mission and evangelism. And uh, I'm very excited to hear what she has to say. I know that uh, the search for Catherine was long and uh, extensive and thorough. And uh, as a result of that, we have a, a wonderful, wonderful person here. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know Catherine in the future, and I'm sure you all are too. And, but I wanted uh, just to say a little prayer before we start and then uh, introduce Catherine. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather here together. Be with those who are suffering today, those who are in need. Um, especially, we offer up in prayer uh, Cheryl Heenan's mother, uh, also Bob Wing, uh, Dana Snee, Dora Quarles, Ann Lewis. Um, also, offer prayers for, for Paige, be with her as her cancer has returned. Also, <coughs> be with Steve Hayner and his family as he is dealing with his cancer. Mm -hmm. And also with uh, Diane's mom, because she is going to find out what's going on with her and help her to get better. But Lord, we ask all these things. In your son's name, and we ask that you pour out your spirit on us today, and that we can do your will and be your servants. In your son's name, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you guys. Pairs and Spares uh, is just such a vibrant and dynamic class, and as I've settled in this month, your reputation for welcoming new folks to the congregation and uh, for praying for the life of our church uh, has just really struck me. So thank you uh, for this chance to be with you. My first month at Shalford has been wonderful. I'm sure you know, but maybe it's good to hear from a bit of an outsider how impressive it is that this is such a hands-on congregation that you guys have um, folks that just jump into mission, nine Christian education classes for adults. Uh, and just some really great people. So it is a joy uh, to be here, and I have loved every minute of uh, the first month uh, here with you guys. Um, I love how John titled uh, what I was gonna be sharing with you today. He said, to talk about your faith walk and how I came here to Shalliford. And um, John, I know you're a recovering Baptist, but you were, you were, <laughs> you were channeling Calvin when you wrote this. As soon as I read it, I thought, ah, that is book one, sentence one of Calvin's Institutes. This is how it starts, are you ready? Our wisdom, in so far as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. But as these are connected together by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of the two proceeds and gives birth to the other. He just grabs you right there, you know, at the start, and you can't wait for the next five books. Uh, but so as I, as I thought about how to answer John's question, I thought about sort of how I came into knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Uh, and if I just marched you through the chronology of my life, you would A, be bored, and B, you might get a little bit of a whiplash because uh, I've moved seven times in my 20s never to move again. Um, and so I've got the big girl couch and the big girl washer and dryer. It is staying put. Um, never but, say never. I know, I know. <laughs> but um, so I'm going to hopefully just offer up a few vignettes uh, along the way of my story. And hopefully we'll have um, many other chances to get to know each other and for me to do some listening. This is very out of character for me to stand up and talk about myself for 30 minutes. But um, know that you guys, I know it's a big class, but you are certainly welcome to interrupt me at any time. And I'll try and leave a little time for Q&A at the end, too. So. Uh, don't hesitate to, to stop me. I had two older brothers, so I'm used to never, you know, fully having the word. Um, 
So if we can start at the present, start uh, also in scripture and talk about how I would come to accept a call to be associate pastor for mission and discipleship. Uh, and as we do that, y'all talk back to me. Think of any Bible stories that might understand, might uh, inform your understanding of mission. Paul. Paul. All right. Fabulous. Anything else? I'll have to throw in James. James. Okay. <laughs> great. These are great answers. Peter. <laughs> Peter. All right. All right. Any specific stories? I mean, we got some great, some great guys rocking out. And the Great Commission. That Jesus gave. The Great Commission. Perfect. Perfect. Feed my sheep. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. And then same question for discipleship. What, what scriptures may inform what you understand as Christian discipleship? The of the disciples. Perfect. Yes. Anything else? Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopian eunuch. Gotta love the eunuch. Okay. Well, we'll be developing some more scriptures. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, so for me, I, I would say probably two of the, the, the seminal texts for me of understanding mission and discipleship. Um, for me, the, the sort of crowd favorite is the Good Samaritan story, right? That we are to go out and to see the person who is in need and to help them, but also help them get up and go on their way as we continue to go up and on our way. And then the second one, um, I would say I'm... I'm I've been intrigued in the last couple of years with the story of Jesus teaching um, the Lord's Prayer. And it, he does great educational ministry here because when you read it in Luke, like he's modeling prayer and the disciples come up and they interrupt him and they say, hey, can you teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples how to pray? And uh, so Jesus says, OK, here it goes a little something like this, you know, and then he gives us the Lord's Prayer. And that's how that starts. And so um, I know the rest of you aren't Baptists because I'm not seeing very many Bibles, but without looking, <laughs> can, can any, does anybody have a clue what story falls in between the Good Samaritan and the teaching of the Lord's Prayer in Luke? No I know, I know. See, the zipper gives him away. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So there's this little jewel of the story of Mary and Martha. And remember that there weren't like chapters or verses until the 1200s. So for Luke, this is just one story going along. And so in between the Good Samaritan and the Lord's Prayer, he tucks the story of the Good Samaritan. And in my mind, at least, if the story of um, the Good Samaritan is all about seeing Christ in the other, then the story of Mary and Martha is all about hearing Christ and what, um, what Christ is trying to teach us. Um, do you want to give us a, a dramatic reading of Luke 10, 38 to 42? It's just five verses. I'll be happy to. All right, all right, fabulous. Oh, <laughs> Before it gets too dramatic. I love it. I love it. <laughs> In the course of their journey, he came to a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat down at the Lord's feet and listened to him speaking. Now Martha, who was distracted with all the serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister is leaving me to do all the serving by myself? Please tell, please tell her to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you worry and fret about so many things, and yet few are needed. Indeed, only one. It is Mary who has chosen the better part, and it is not to be taken from her. Perfect. Thank you. So hold that in the back of your head as I begin to tell you a little different pieces of my story. So many of you know that I was at Columbia Seminary in Decatur. Uh, Chris and Sarah were a touch ahead of me, but I knew they were rock stars even then uh, before they were launched out into the world. Um, and in my third year, I did uh, my chaplaincy internship uh, downtown at Grady, which 
is a whole other class. My mom wants me to write a book, but I'm pretty sure that would violate all HIPAA laws. But uh, <laughs> hilarity and heartbreaking and just unbelievable uh, experiences. And in the midst of this, they sort of ask you, what is your pastoral identity? Who are you as someone who is called to serve God in ministry? And they gave us all these great examples, like maybe you're the drum major pastor, or maybe you are Paul the tent maker, or maybe you are Peter the rock, or the wounded healer, right? A little Nowlin and Carl Jung. And I just, you know, I tried to try on all of these hats, and none of them fit. And so finally, I just invented my, my alter ego personality, which was I am going to be Pastor Mary Martha. This is my title because uh, A, if you meet a woman named Mary Martha, she's almost certainly Southern, right? She's got the double name and she's rocking it. So that fits. And then the Martha side of me is very much a doer and a, and a type A kind of person uh, and likes to make sure that other people are, are served. And then the Mary part of me, though, really likes to listen and to see if I can see that image of God in other people. And so that, that was sort of how that fit. And for me, Mary Martha, that is this chaplain Mary Martha, Pastor Mary Martha uh, understanding of myself bridges that um, bridges mission and discipleship. It bridges the Good Samaritan and teaching the Lord's Prayer and how to pray to others. I love that Mary and Martha together become an example of what it means to do what God calls us to do, but also to be who we are as children of God. Does that make sense? So finding that balance in my life and, and coming to the point of, of naming that sense of call in me is something that started way back. Um, you can always go back to, to some childhood. Many of y'all know that I grew up in Chattanooga on, on Signal Mountain. My dad is the son of a Presbyterian pastor. Uh, my grandfather, Dub, was a senior pastor of First Presbyterian Church of the booming metropolis of Florence, South Carolina, uh, for 26 years. And so that was most of Dad's childhood. Uh, and uh, Dad grew up and, and became a, a lawyer and uh, has always practiced small town law in Chattanooga. And then uh, my mom is the daughter of a school teacher and a DuPont uh, worker. I've never understood what DuPont does, but um, they make stuff. Uh, uh, and so uh, her two older brothers became doctors, but mom was an elementary education and home economics major. Uh, and mom, I mean, she put Martha Stewart to shame. This is another <laughs> part of my Martha thing. My mom hand sewed each of our Halloween costumes. She could cut a watermelon basket with like one stroke, you know, to like fill with then, you know, bald fruit and stuff. Uh, and we had dinner as a family every night together. Uh, and so this was sort of uh, the stuff of my childhood. We'd go to church and we'd drive home. And as early as I can remember, we always spent the drive home critiquing the sermon and whether or not it like towed the line for the reform tradition. Um, so when I got to theology in college, I was like, what are we learning? This is, this is sort of the givens in life. And it felt like the givens, so I had to take a step back. Um, I'm a third child. I have two wonderful older brothers. Uh, David was our, our brainiac child. He's Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law. Uh, and he is married and practices law and has two wonderful uh, daughters, Abby and Maddie, who are one and three. Uh, we'll all get to go to the beach together in August. Uh, and then my middle brother, John, was sort of an international man of mystery. Uh, he was president of his fraternity his sophomore year in college, as that tells you of his uh, many social <laughs> skills. And uh, John there went to law school and, and now works for the State Department. So um, I love my brothers, and they are two of my dearest and closest friends uh, in life. And our parents all the way through really, I think, had three core values that they wanted to communicate to their three children, and that was education, travel, and faith. They loved learning. They loved to take us places. Oh, we'd drive anywhere. We drove to Vermont at least three times to go look at covered bridges and black and white cows and Amish villages. I mean, it was just, you know, that was childhood. And, and then faith. We were always in church on Sunday. My dad was an elder the whole, the whole nine yards, but we didn't talk about it very much. It was sort of like a, a private thing, but it was, it was a thing. Like, you were definitely doing it, but we didn't sit around talking about it too much. That was, you know, too whatever. Um, 
So I grew up Presbyterian in a very vibrant, large, loving congregation. Uh, and I can remember when I first started to think about claiming faith as my own, it was sixth grade confirmation class. And um, I just, I was really concerned that it was just too convenient that I had been born into the right faith to begin with, right? Like, what if I'd been born in India or been born, you know, in, in somewhere in Europe where they weren't, you know, practicing a faith necessarily or, or whatever. And so what I... Have you been born in Baptist? Exactly. <laughs> no, I know. It was predestined that you're to be with us, though, John. It's all good. <laughs> So I went, I, and this was a big, like, I snuck and bought this book on all the world religions, and I read the whole thing, you know, just to make sure that I wasn't picking my first choice, you know, like, you know, just the first thing that came across. Um, but in the end, I decided that this really was for me. And so uh, on, on Confirmation Sunday, I, uh, I grew up in a very conservative Presbyterian church, so I, I definitely understood my faith as sort of praying the sinner's prayer and accepting Christ into my heart and giving my life to him and I was blessed to be in a congregation that just nurtured that and loved me. I had great Bible studies uh, all the way through high school um, and, and good friends who are still solid spiritual friends today. I've been in all of their weddings and, and that was a great group. Um, but it was my ninth grade English teacher. I loved ninth grade English, that, that best class ever. Um, and we were going over one of my papers, and I can still remember the afternoon, he sort of looked up, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, Catherine, you just, you love people, and you love God, and you love writing, and you love thinking about hard things, like, have you, you know, have you thought about becoming a minister? And I, and I, you know, I said, well, maybe, but I really want to be president because I know how to fix <laughs> all of this stuff that's wrong. And so I'm not really sure that ministries for me, my grandfather did that and my aunt did that, and she's a little bit of the black sheep of the family. So I'm not sure that that's where I'm headed, but I, I stayed open to it. And um, went to Davidson College, thinking about religion, but also taking all kinds of different classes. Um, I shared a little bit in my sermon, was it last week, two weeks ago, um, about the, my conversion on the first day of college to go from French to Spanish. And I, <laughs> it was very distinct, very, very clear. Um, I had gone all the way through AP French, and, and when I changed over to Spanish, I wasn't really sure what God was doing in my life. Um, and this has been a theme for me too in faith, that I can kind of say to God, like, I'm willing to go this far. And God has been very generous with me to say, okay, we'll take step one. And then, you know, if God had showed me step five, I might not have showed up. But, um, you know, if I can just take step one, then that's okay. So I took step one into Spanish. And then Spanish led me into these introductions to what had happened in Central America in the 80s and into um, the life of Father Romero, who was uh, a Catholic priest who really just felt this incredibly strong call to be with the poor and to suffer alongside of them, especially as a lot of the civil wars were getting nasty in Central America. And so that led me to take just one more step and to sign up for what they called a reverse mission trip to Nicaragua. Uh, and it was reverse because our mission was when we got back home. We were only going to Nicaragua to see, to listen, to like Mary, just sit at the feet of the people that were there to learn about their faith, to learn about their culture, to learn about their history and their politics. Um, and so I, I went on that trip and I can remember the night that we were sitting in a rural village uh, with the people and I was looking around and there were just no men between the ages of say 15 and 40. And I, I, math is not my strong suit, y'all will learn that fast, but I'm trying to do the math in my head and I'm thinking like, the population should have been replenished by now. Like even if all your men were killed, you know, in this war, I'm thinking there should be some men sort of in the prime, you know, age bracket or whatever. And so I asked the women in my broken Spanish, I'm three semesters in at this point, like, donde están los hombres, you know? And um, some of them said, well, he's gone to get work uh, in Mexico or he's gone to get work in Tejas. But two of the women said, my son, 
and the other, my husband, has gone to this mysterious place called Carolina del Norte, or North Carolina. <laughs> and that just stuck with me so much, but I didn't know what it meant until I got back home, and the people who had just been in the background, all of a sudden, the man that was cooking my <coughs> sandwich was Olga's husband, who she just was breaking her heart for him to be up here making money, but it was the only thing that was keeping her and the children alive. Or um, I'd go and walk past the new addition to our student center, and all of a sudden, that was, that was Maria's son. And, and he's there, and he's building that building um, to, you know, to provide for his family. And all of a sudden, what was the wallpaper was suddenly so loud and clear. And I had all these questions like, well, where do these people worship? And, and how do these people understand God? And where are they living? Because they're certainly not living very close to idyllic, you know, Davidson, North Carolina. Um, it's sort of Montreat, uh, you know, two hours away. Um, and so this launched me on what has been almost a decade long journey of trying to figure out what is going on with Latino immigration, especially in the Southeast. Um, and I, I knew enough by then, I'd given up being president, and I knew that I wasn't gonna save Nicaragua, but I knew that I could talk to people in the church. That much I knew I could claim. And so my reverse mission, instead of fixing Nicaragua, became teaching and looking at scripture with mainline Protestant folk and learning about the neighbors that were flooding in to different neighborhoods uh, and trying to ask questions and really respect lots of different sides and lots of different viewpoints um, as we figured out what was going on in our country and what was causing what was happening. It's, it's quite apropos for what's going on in the news right now. Um, so that was a really, that has been and continues to be an important chain uh, in, in my faith journey and really looking in the Bible at the alien, the neighbor, and, and hospitality. Those three themes in scripture. I, obviously I could go on for way longer than y'all want to listen about those three themes, but um, those, those became the central core of what was a religion thesis, became a seminary, not just thesis, but curriculum to share with folks. Um, so that was that, was that piece. Um, so after I left Davidson, uh, I knew that I was headed to, to seminary at some point, but I also knew that I um, wanted to grow up a little bit. I still get carded every time I go to a restaurant, so like talking to you about your marriage and children, I just thought maybe I should take a few years, get a little age under my belt. So I went and worked for the Presbyterian United Nations office for a year in New York. I did what every parent dreams their little girl will do, I moved to Harlem. And, uh, <laughs> and lived there for a year, and that was quite an education uh, in race and in culture. Uh, and then uh, headed to England to get a master's in international relations. Uh, it was a Rotary scholarship, if any of you are Rotarians, shout out to you guys. Um, but I can remember, too, another moment where I was sitting with my, Met I, I went Methodist in, in Britain, there were no Presbyterians to be found. Um, <laughs> and, and that was the, the option, the alternative to those happy clappy churches, as they call them. No happy clappy, will this be Methodist? Uh, and so I would, I would hang out with their young people and they took us to this Welsh spiritual retreat center. Um, and I, I had the same offers from, from Princeton and Union and Columbia, and this was yet another time in my life when I said to God, like, I'm not really sure if I'm signing up for the whole, like, collar and, and ordained for life and ministry thing, but I can definitely tell you that I'm supposed to go to seminary. I can articulate that much, God. I'll, I'll sign on to that. And I didn't think I wanted to come to Columbia, but that whole weekend that I was in this sort of misty, boggy, sheep-ridden, you know, uh, retreat center, um, it just seemed really clear. It also helped that in the midst of that cold, rainy nastiness, it was like, hmm, sweet tea, fried okra, <laughs> summer Braves games. I could get excited about this. And so I really did, joking aside, feel a great call to Columbia. And that was um, just three of the happiest years of my life. I could give 
any gift to brothers and sisters in Christ, it would be the gift to study and to just learn the scriptures and um, learn those stories and just keep um, interacting with faith as an adult. Uh, and that for me has been just a lifeblood of my faith, to be able to keep asking questions and to be part of a church and to be part of a tradition that values your mind and everything you have to bring to it. Uh, and that was, I mean, you know, the start of the Christian education love was, was in, um, with creating the curriculum after Nicaragua, but, but as I fell in love with learning, and I actually fell in love with teaching summer Greek, less because, I mean, Greek is a lovely language, but not super functional in the day-to-day, -day. Um, but I loved being with new seminary students, and I did that for two summers, and just walking with them, and, and learning, and understanding how our learning and who we are are so integrally related. Um, and, and I love adult learners because I think it's great that we sit for an hour every Sunday, really two hours in some ways, and learn something new. Where else in your life do you get to do that unless you, know, you sit at home and watch PBS all day or, or whatever, but it's so rare to have a forum for adults to gather together and to learn together. Um, Christian education continued to be a huge role as I, I moved to Dallas to be a Lilly resident. Um, that's like, think of a medical residency where you itinerate through cardio and pediatric and OB-GYN and you know, whatever. And in Dallas, I got to sort of itinerate through the different areas of that church's life, but there were three Christian educators there, and those women got a hold of me early, uh, and just cheered me on and walked with me and gave me opportunities to grow. Uh, and man, that was it. I, by the end of it, I, I can preach a sermon, but if I could just teach Sunday school for the rest of my life, like that would be it. I, I would be a happy woman. Um, and so uh, that led to a call to uh, working with young adults in Nashville and trying to figure out this enigma of how young adulthood um, is changing uh, and how life looks very different and church involvement looks very different. Uh, if you don't even think about getting married till you're 30 and, and, and maybe, maybe not have kids after that, then we can't count on the baptism ringing them back in at 23, you know? Like it's, it's gonna take some different thinking. Um, and then when this call appeared the first time and Lisa and her committee were working tirelessly, I said, no, 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 I'll just stay here in Nashville. It's all good. My friends were calling me, do you know that Shallowford has this position open that's mission and discipleship? And I said, no, no, no. Um, so I put it out of my mind and man, they went through the mud a couple more months and more months and more months and then they had to redo everything. And then they reposted and I said, okay, God, lightning does not strike twice. <laughs> and I know these people are really amazing. And I know Chris Henry is a fantastic pastor and preacher and maybe we should just have a conversation. And I think the whole thing took maybe three or four months, which is lightning fast in the Presbyterian church for uh, <laughs> things to move. Uh, so, and a huge part of that is the professionalism of, uh, of the five, uh, six at the beginning folks that uh, were on that committee. So let me stop there. What um, questions or uh, thoughts or anything do y'all have for me? What's your big hope for your ministry here? Ooh, I have so many, John. I'm, um, I'm so excited to continue to walk alongside the great education programs that are that are going on, and I'm really jazz. I'm, I've never even fathomed a place that is so roll your sleeves up and dive into mission. And I would just love to see both of those continue to grow and also continue to complement each other. Um, as we learn about the city of Atlanta and more, y'all, many of you are lifetime natives, but learn about other neighborhoods and learn about other folks and learn about the folks that we serve and all the different ministries we're already engaged in. Um, but then also learn what that means for our relationship with God and go deeper into scripture and the stories that make us who we are uh, and figure out how that resonates today in the 21st century. Um, so I'm excited about some really good worshiping and really good learning and really good serving. Those are all on tap. 
Catherine, <laughs> I, I knew the minute I met you that I was going to like you. Oh, and after hearing you in the Sunday school class, we have really got a gift. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Was there another hand back there? Yeah. What are your hobbies? Ooh. Um, well, my most constant hobby is my entirely worthless dog, who is nine pounds. It's Chihuahua. Um, I pr she was my quarter life crisis. I got her for my 25th birthday, and um, she needed to be covert because she might have been against the Columbia housing policies uh, in the dorms, but she's very small and very portable. Uh, so Vita and I love to hang out and go for walks all the time. We went on a big walk yesterday, like right in the heat of the day. I don't know what I was thinking, um, but we, we got our exercise in. And then um, I'm uh, a beater. I like to make jewelry, especially with glass. Uh, and I picked up when my first niece was born three years ago, I had some women in the church teach me some knitting. So I'm very good at rectangles, so scarf, <laughs> blanket, uh, anything harder than that, not yet. Um, yeah, those are, that would be a start. Halloween costumes? I know, right? No, I mean, that was the thing is I'm just so not worthy of all my mother's gifts. And I still, like, even when I moved this time, I was like, Mom, you just take the closet. And she, I mean, she will just hang everything right where it's supposed to be. She'll, I just, I just organize by color, right? I need a black shirt. And Mom's like, here are the knits, and here are the socks. <laughs> and then in a great motherly way, and here I thought the Goodwill might use. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Thanks. Got it. Um, so, yeah. Where do you live? I, uh, I live very close by at the Amley, beside Publix. So, I, uh, part of Evita's in my walk yesterday was walking to church and just seeing it can be done in case there's ever <laughs> car problems or anything else. <laughs> yeah. Christmas Eve and Easter walk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you read for free reading? <laughs> Ooh, free reading. So, okay. I, uh, I, my, my brothers, very bright and capable young men from the get-go. I was an incredibly sickly child, uh, and I did not really read, read until third grade. I had some major sort of letters moving all around on me, and so the idea of reading for fun. I mean, reading was sort of punishment anyway for all of the, I mean, you would think after two master's degrees I would have picked up, like, hey, it's going to be part of life. Um, so I didn't read for fun at all until uh, January of 2012. I went to the Christian educators meeting in Orlando, and one of my friends had a free tickets for us to go to um, Harry Potter World. Mm -hmm. And so I went, and I experienced Harry Potter World, and as I watched all these small children, I was like, really, Catherine, can you not get on board like can you just not buy in these people even have like an official drink and roller coasters so i read all of the harry potter series and like so like along with my 12 year old friends i can claim that jk rowling like inspired me to read so i read all of that and all of the divergent literature right now i'm reading um well i'm starting mountains beyond mountains to get that read before our trip to haiti uh, and reading, I'm actually reading some different exhilarating books on uh, Presbyterian mission theory and education theory. Uh, I know that usually puts me to bed pretty quickly. Um, and some other comedy stuff. I'm really open to suggestions now because I feel like I've just, it's so different reading for information versus reading for enjoyment and pleasure. And it's this whole other world that now that I'm done with all these master's degrees that I can actually embrace and enjoy. So yes, always open to a, a reading suggestion in my inbox. Mm -hmm. What countries have you been to? I heard you've been to a number of different countries. Oh. You mentioned Nicaragua. Uh -huh. Um, let's see, 22. So my two biggest trips, um, I was really proud of 22 until my brother at the State Department and I started comparing and he's up to like 40 something. So um, he, uh, let's see, so one of my big trips was, um, this is just what every 20 year old dreams of doing, but I submitted a grant proposal to travel with three of my friends to trace the development of the Reformation through Europe. It's actually a brilliant plan because it took us to all of the major fun cities in Europe. So that covered, you know, England, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Prague. Prague is not a country, the Czech Republic. Um, uh, Germany, and then all the little, you know, Netherlands, the Hague, all that good stuff. And then I studied abroad in Spain. Uh, and then another great um, 
trip that I was so blessed to take uh, was in seminary to go to the Holy Land. Uh, and we, we actually started in Damascus. It's, um, it's so hard for me to watch the news because, I mean, my suffering, but all the cities we went to in Syria are just rubble now, but we went to homes and we went um, Damascus, I, I mean, several, pl- I mean, lots of places in Syria. And then we uh, came down and went through Jordan, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, Israel, and then just to Greece because we could, I guess. Uh, and we pretended like we were talking about Paul, but it was, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so getting to go to the Holy Land really, um, for me, changed the Bible from kind of a once upon a time story to uh, let me give you testimony of what it's like there. I've gotten to sit in the ruins of that synagogue. I, I, I've gotten to see that lamp or, or, or touch that place. And so um, that, that may be one of my hopes, John, is that we could maybe get together. Uh, we'll give it a little while. Israel and Palestine also not doing too well, but um, things change pretty fast over there. And so I'd love for us to get to see um, some parts of the Holy Land. We could start maybe with like a wine tour of Paul's journeys or something, you know, like like a first step, and then uh, keep moving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> we could make it theological. I could work on that. Um, yeah. What else? We have a vision for shallow control and education with respect to the youth and the school. Or a vision for how we can take the spirit that you've uh, put together and with your best travel experiences, how we can expand our reach, uh, not necessarily sitting in a room like this, but by digital communication and us more as developing teachers to expand our faith and what we do to a lot much wider area across the world where you obviously travel a lot. <laughs> I love it. So tell, so you've got this children and youth piece of the question and then yeah, sort of the larger communication piece. The ch- uh, so Jay is still over uh, Jay's youth area. I, I'm, I'm supervisor of the children's ministry. So um, that part of things, Prue and I uh, and Amy Kate have already sat down and looked at Testament Travelers and looked at our scope and sequence on that. And um, really, so I was one of those children that despite being in church every day with wonderful church people, I got into Old Testament and every class opened with prayer and we started praying for uh, Ruth and Naomi and, and Samuel and I looked up and I was like does anybody know who these people are because I'm not really sure exactly. <laughs> Naomi knows who Naomi is. I know, I know. Um, so, um, so I love that we're very intentionally trying to introduce our children to the stories uh, and working through that and that is going to be um, at the heart of what I work with the children's director, continuing to work with the children's director on. I think y'all are on a great start. And I love your classrooms for children's ministry, by the way. What fun. Um, so youth, Jay will continue to be taken care of. For adult education, um, I would love to keep working on teacher empowerment and teacher training, teaching teachers to ch- teach. Also, I mean, if there's interest, and this is one of those things that you come in and uh, this is where the Mary of me takes over, I'm really in that listening phase. Um, but listening to maybe desires for more small groups, ways to um, continue to support Presbyterian women doing their thing, but also, um, you know, working with, um, uh, you know, different areas and different neighborhoods, different interests that might be there for parenting, for um, New Testament Bible studies, for Old Testament uh, different stories, for thematic studies. Um, as far as taking it on out, that's a really good question. Um, I can see seeds and possibilities, uh, certainly with our relationship with Shalom and with Memorial Drive as we continue um, to just support that ministry that seems so vibrant and exciting uh, and working with GAD, I think there's a lot of, of possibility there. And I think as we make more and more bridges between our mission and our discipleship, between outreach and education, that we'll continue to find the ways that the Spirit is calling us to be both learners and doers. Uh, and I think those are, I mean, in my life, uh, those two are laced so closely together that I can't separate them. So I hope that'll that'll take us to new places together. Caitlin, have you met Caitlin? I have not met Caitlin yet, and apparently she lives in my apartment complex. So I keep introducing myself to people, but maybe she doesn't have a dog. Well, if you go over to the food when we do food on Thursday, uh-huh. she's there. Okay, absolutely want to do that.
Nico. Mm -hmm. We have almost no ministry to single adults. Is there something in the future for that? You know, we have some friends who fit in that category and sure. they don't have a church to go to and so invite them here only to worship the sort of Absolutely. Um, that is, as you would imagine, something that's uh, close to my heart. I um, So in Dallas, the way that we were um, successful, it was sort of something we stumbled into, but for younger single adults, um, I thought that, so Preston Hollow, we referred to Preston Hollow as our daughter that married well. First Dallas launched Preston Hollow and then they doubled the, our size and, and, and became a very affluent church. And so I, uh, I had assumed that they were, you know, knocking out young adult ministry and just had all, you know, young adults and single ministry and had that all covered. And as I became good friends with the pastor there, I realized like they'd have maybe three or four show up on a Sunday morning uh, in a church of 3,000. And so um, we decided, well, what if this is one of the blessings of Presbyterian Church that we're connectional and relational? What would it look like if some of our Bible studies and some of our fellowship events were shared among churches that were in a five mile radius of each other, five, ten mile radius of each other? Then you have the excitement of new friends to play with when you come out to a cocktail hour or come to a, a Bible study. Um, but you also get to stay connected and, and because you know nobody just wants to be with their own little demographic. And so it's so nice in church world to have these intergenerational relationships. So it kept people in their churches. It was non-threatening because we were all Presbyterian and we weren't worried about stealing sheep. Uh, and so found some great synergy in, in, um, it, you know, in sharing different small groups and non you know, 11 a.m. to noon hours on Sunday together, looking at the other parts of the week and figuring out how we could connect. So I'd love to work on that, and I'd love to work to, um, you know, over, is it, I mean, at least 60% of our population, I think, is single in the United States. So we, we've got a lot of work. Is that, Robbie, do you know the stats on that right off? I don't, I don't, but I mean, it's, it's, I do know what was yeah, it was a it was a huge. I mean, a, a large number of folks uh, of adults are. So I would love to see us moving in that direction and 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 keeping that intentionally uh, before us. Uh -huh. well, Naomi, yeah, well, I, I know it's Naomi with the red hair. Come on. Um, I just wanted to affirm something you said. Uh, I've been to Israel twice. Mm -hmm. The Bible never never left me until I went. I went with a minister and his wife, and we did Bible every day, and we just really, it's a wonderful place to go. Now it's not good. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, because they're fighting. Uh, but they were when I went. Mm -hmm. So Lebanon was mom. I mean, we had to go into a um, air raid shelter mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it still was the best place of my life. Oh, thank you. I thank you for twice. that. I love it. Well, two anecdotes on that. One, you're much more likely to get in a wreck on the way to the Atlanta airport and, and be injured than be injured in Israel-Palestine statistically. I've, I've looked at the numbers. Um, and uh, it, two, it, it just transforms your faith. My parents are in love with Europe, like many a baby boomer, and um, I have told them you are not going to Europe again until we go to the Holy Land together because it's so transformational and it's still Mediterranean you still get all the good food and all that so like you're not you're not losing out on that that front um, but that'll that we can definitely put that on the dreams and hopes list John for for the years to come again maybe not in the next few months we'll we'll let it settle down a little bit you know Ed and I went two years ago and what they put us through in New York before we got on that airplane they almost didn't let me go because I moved my suitcase over I mean, that would really, but coming back, there was no problem. Mm -hmm. but going over there, they are strict. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And Ed was a little bit afraid to go, but mm -hmm. we went, and there was no, there were no incidences at all. Sure, yeah. sure. And, and I mean, the Presbyterian Church has fantastic mm -hmm. mission partners over there. The um, actually, one of my uh, friends who was at, I always mess this up. Central? No. What's the church across from uh, the Capitol? 
Central. So she was the Lily resident at Central, and she married a guy who works for the Carter Foundation, and now she is one of the Presbyterian reps for uh, peacemaking over in Jerusalem. They're based in Jerusalem, and so um, uh, I'll, we'll have to touch base with Kate and see if we can get something fun uh, together, because she's over there working with all different Presbyterian groups as they come through. But yeah, how we do? Ooh, we're there on time. I'm trying to be a good. <laughs> soldier. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Appreciate it. Good to be with you guys.